Tonight's program was made for transmission two years ago, but was delayed for legal reasons. John Kamara has now spent 18 years in prison. Jamie Osmond as they come to three out now. It's Julie Jones in the lead. On March the 12th, 1981, there was an argument at the betting shop in Lodge Lane, Liverpool 8. I'm gonna make you two keep out of it. You need to pay the guy. You want to bet on late. You can't get your money for it. It's pure and simple. I'm not a hero. No, 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 no. It was enough to make the manager, a young man of 23 called John Suffield, fear for his life. You're not gonna get your money, mate. After he locked up that night, he told his family he'd been worried the angry punter would be waiting outside to kill him. In fact, John Suffield was to die the next day, though not at the hands of that angry customer. Two other men were convicted of his murder, one rightly so. The other has so far served 16 years for a murder he did not commit. From that very first moment when he was arrested, I think he said, you must be joking, but from that very first moment to now, 16 years later, so he's never changed his story. Never, and, well, he never will. He saw me. He'll die first before he'll change his story. Why should he give them the satisfaction of shutting the case when it's not in? At half past nine next morning, Friday the 13th, the betting shop manager, Mr. Suffield, came to open up. He was bundled inside by two men. They tied him up with cord while they opened the safe where there was a small amount of money. There was a smaller safe inside with a combination lock. To extract the number, one of the intruders tortured Mr. Suffield, stabbing him 19 times. John Suffield had a stammer. He may have been killed because, in his terror, he simply couldn't get the words out. Banknotes were abandoned, soaked in blood. The two men got away with less than 200 pounds in notes and coins. It would be 25 minutes before staff arrived to find the body. But what happened in the critical minutes before the murder had not gone unobserved. Chris Guidio was on the top of a bus, stuck in traffic just a few yards further along the road. He saw three men loitering suspiciously. The time, he thought, was 9.20. And Barbara Edmonds, on her way to do the shopping, saw a couple of men scuffling with a white man outside the betting shop. She thought they were just fooling about. This was at 9.33. The day after the murder, Mrs. Edmund sat with policemen and drew up these identical pictures of the men she saw. And Chris Guidio, a professional artist, sketched this picture of a man he saw. I saw this one I, I just took to be a, a scuffle thing at the time, and it was uh, chaps encircling another, you know, sort of inside the doorway of a a thing and, it, and the bus moved off. It's all very brief and it, it registered only only uh, on, a, on a level of, of um, just, just minor disgust, just these, these sort of things, and the bus pulled off. Other people see murders like other people walk in front of buses. You don't see murders, you know. Sixteen years ago, the black community of Liverpool 8, the area which would soon become notorious as Toxteth, kept themselves to themselves. They had their own drinking clubs, and lots of them. The Ebo, the Sierra Leone, the Skyline. And the Yoruba, or, as it was known to its clientele, the Eurobar. Now that the clubs have moved into Liverpool city centre, this is all that's left of the old Eurobar. A place where people would come to drink, to smoke, to enjoy the music, and sometimes to plot tomorrow's criminal villainy.
The betting shop murder was the talk of the Eurobar next day, and a matter of understandable anxiety to a man who was bound to be one of the police's prime suspects. I was involved in an argument with the bookie, or the settler, and uh, the argument got overheated, and I, I did threaten him. I had a legal battle, and I wanted what was mine, which was, you know, the returns, the, you know, the money for the bet. I said, you know, I, I won't pay enough, and if it don't get paid up, you know, I'll fix you, I'll sort you out. I'll fix you, I'll sort you out? Yeah. Did you say I'll kill you? No, I didn't say I'll kill you. I, I actually threatened him, I said, you know, I, I will sort you out, I won't pay enough that bet. I went up the next morning, and to my surprise, it was all cordoned off. And there's a bystander. And I asked him, well, you know, what the hell's going on here? And he, he replied, someone's being killed. Among the first to be arrested was a man called Raymond Gilbert, a petty but unpredictable crook, a man who gives the lie to the romantic fiction that there is any honour among thieves. People just never liked him because he knew he was, he was just trouble. And I think most people are going to tell you that anyway. He's a troubled man. What a dangerous man. A sneak. Um, how would you put it? If you had an argument with him, and then a fight was going to come, he'll, he'll back out for you. So you'll tear it away next to him and he'll do you from behind. That's what type of person Gilbert is. Raymond Gilbert confessed to the murder within hours of being taken to Admiral Street Police Station. He told the police he got angry with his victim and that it was he, Gilbert, who was solely responsible for the fatal stabbing. We lose no sleep over Gilbert. The man we do worry about is a man whose name Gilbert offered to the police as his supposed accomplice. Johnny Kamara was also a petty criminal and had done the odd job with Gilbert. Apart from this criminal relationship with Gilbert, he'd also slept with Gilbert's girlfriend, a fatal indiscretion. And he was angry over it. He was just naming, as she said, naming names, and then he used Johnny as a name, because Johnny slept with his girlfriend or something. And that was a good enough reason for him to have a grudge. Well, that's what Gilbert thinks it was. <laughs> to use it to put my wife for 16 years. Yeah. Not a Toxteth then? No. Another group here. We call it South End. South End you call it? That's what it's called, South End. That's a name Hesseltine made up. Really? What? Yeah, Toxteth people really call it South End then? Do that's, that's what it's called. You've got South End and North End of Liverpool. It might have happened just across the road, didn't it? They were pulling in every, every person who was black. They were dragging every young person who was black. So in a way it was no like surprise that it came for your brother? No surprise. He was black, he lived in on him being down there. And um they're not even known well to drag him in. When the police came to pick up Kamara, they found him hiding in the attic. I mean he thought he was getting done for a robbery that which he did get sentenced for it anyway, and but uh, in his eyes they stitched the murder on him as well. Well, he got two for the price of one. These were the days before the safeguards of the Police and Criminal Evidence Act. No tape recorders, no right to have a solicitor present. And if the Toxteth police thought they had good cause to arrest you, even the innocent had reason to fear interrogation. Especially being black, it was, it was a nightmare. <laughs> you were second class, you got treated as a second class person. You, was, you know, they, they had no time for you. You know, nigger, wog, whatever they used to call us in them days. Oh, they'd send a, you know, fairly well-built officer in, and he'd rough you up. You know, you know, you committed this murder. You know, you'd, you'd look him in the eye and say, "It's got nothing to do with me. I'm not the type of guy to be going down killing people, and I'm innocent." Be banging on the table and. Physically having a go at you, you know, like slapping you. What, what can you do in them days? What, what could you do? You can't turn around and hit him back, smack him back or give him a dig. 
and after two 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 days of, uh, of that sort of pressure you wonder where you know what is actually going on is it have i committed the crime have i done something the fact that kamara had been hiding wasn't the only reason the police were suspicious there was confusion over when his mother had seen him where he'd been on friday the day of the murder things he'd actually done on thursday got muddled in his original account small wonder if the police believed that along with gilbert they'd got their men the um gray street where abu lived is somewhere just around there it doesn't really exist anymore right over in l8 and although Kamara's always denied any involvement in the murder, he was in the approximate area on the morning in question. He'd gone to the house of his uncle Abu, less than a mile from the betting shop, the scene of the murder. He said he wanted to see if a gyro check had arrived. But the police found that Kamara had cashed a gyro only the day before. He could hardly be expecting another. As for uncle Abu, his statement was fatal. He said he'd seen Johnny on the Friday of the murder. Friday the 13th. And Johnny wasn't alone. It was in the morning when he made me a cup of tea. A friend of his, Gibbo, called. So Gibbo, or Gilbert, according to Kamara's own uncle, had been with Kamara minutes before the lethal attack. Kamara denied that. He maintained that he could account for all his movements on the morning of the murder. After failing to pick up his gyro at Uncle Abu's early that morning, he'd gone to Liverpool's pierhead to take a bus to his mother's on the other side of town. He said he'd set off from the pierhead at nine. After he got to his mother's, seven miles away, he was surprised to see his young sister, Donna. Donna had run home upset about a row at school. Kamara had walked her the few hundred yards from his mother's back to school and had seen a master there. To Trial and Error's research team, it didn't add up. A bus journey all the way across town just after committing a bloody murder and within an hour of seeing a man die calmly to pay an unscheduled visit to your sister's school. He was complaining a little bit that I hadn't allowed his sister to go to the toilet. I explained to him I wasn't actually stopping her going to the toilet. What I was doing actually was make, she was going to make up the time because we just had a break. And uh, that she could, I was looking for the keys when she disappeared off home. What time was it that John Kamara came back to the school with Donna? Approximately about five, ten past eleven. The police were called to the betting shop at ten o'clock. So this visit to the school doesn't provide Kamara with an alibi. When the trial and error team retraced the journey, we found he could just about have kept both appointments. The one sinister, the other innocent. Road, six or so miles away from the scene of the murder. Johnny's mother's house is just over there. Right? That's right, on the map. Yeah. Cigarettes down this road, isn't that right? That's right? On the eve of his trial, Kamara tried to buttress his alibi, saying he remembered seeing someone he vaguely knew working on a house here in Grovehurst Avenue, close to his mother's. Could be anywhere. That sighting would have provided a perfect alibi, except that Kamara couldn't remember the man's name. His lawyers gave private investigators the thankless task of trying to trace the man. They drew a blank. Meanwhile, the case for Kamara's guilt was building. On an ID parade, Mrs. Barbara Edmonds, the woman who had seen the men fooling around outside the betting office, picked him out. Though it's fair to say that at an earlier parade, which included Gilbert, the man we know is guilty, she failed to pick Gilbert out. There was more evidence against Kamara. Inmates held in the same prison as Kamara as he waited for trial seemed to say that he had admitted his part in the crime. Kamara had told me Gilbert was mad. Kamara said that there was no reason to stab the man because he was tied I asked up. him if he had done the murder. He said yes. You were with that Gilbert, weren't you? And he said, yeah, he's grasped me up. The police were confident of Gilbert's guilt, but they seemed to have been less than 100% certain about Kamara. But Johnny Kamara was convicted, largely on the basis of the identification and the evidence of those prison inmates. 
For years, the case has worried those who have examined it. And none more so than one of the earliest and foremost champions of justice. The case of Johnny Kamara always haunted Tom Sargent. Sargent was the man who founded Justice, the organization that champions the wrongly convicted. It's a measure of Kamara's misfortune that Sargent died before he could finish the file. Well, when I conducted his appeal about 15 years ago in collaboration with that wonderful man, Tom Sargent of Justice, with whom I did many cases, um, at about that time, this was one of the cases about which I always had a concern as to whether he'd done it. Because although I hadn't been at the trial, I hadn't heard the evidence, I just had a feeling that the conviction was unsatisfactory. A professional feeling? Yes, a, a professional intuition, if you like. As we began to excavate the Kamara case, whole areas of the prosecution would crumble at a touch. We'd find key evidence the jury never heard. That members of Parliament itself had been misinformed about a vital aspect of the case. We couldn't consign this case to history, but the case was touched by history in a very special sense. The trial of Johnny Kamara took place in front of an all-white jury just weeks after riots had reduced much of Toxteth to a smouldering ruin. For the um, years, their youth, their both black and white, have suffered tremendous harassment, abuse, and physical damage by the police, and it seemed to all come together on that day. This was not a mindless action. This was a, a reaction of people, young people, who were getting no way through the system, trying to say to people, you have policemen out there who are out of control. They were, I feel they were expressing an anger there that they didn't want to take any more. Groups of young, uh, young men, black and white, because it's a multiracial community, I mean, stood up to um, big white men in uniforms because the police force um, is predominantly white and they fought them in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The image of the police thrown the, the equipment down, the coats, the batons, the shields, the hats, and running for their lives, that's an image that'll stay with me for the rest of my life. In the shadow of the riots, and in one of the coldest winters in recent memory, up they came for trial. Gilbert, who had confessed to the police, but who was now pleading not guilty. And Johnny Kamara, who has consistently denied any involvement in the crime. Kamara's QC was the defence team's third choice. He had just a week to master the case. The judge was one of the old school. I have to say that I thought the summing up was unfair. On almost every page of it, the judge comments against Mr. Kamara. There's barely any comment that's favorable to him. When I conducted Kamara's appeal 15 years ago, I tried to persuade the Court of Appeal that the summing up was unfair. They wouldn't have it. They disagreed with me. But I think the climate has changed. I don't think that any judge these days would sum up in that way I think that the judge asked a lot of rhetorical questions of the jury, could this, that or the other be the case, inviting the answer yes or no, and in every instance the answer that was invited would be one which was against Mr. Kamara's interest. And obviously the jury get the impression that the judge is hinting a particular view to them. I don't think judges should do that. This is the very court where Raymond Gilbert and Johnny Kamara stood trial for murder. Theirs was one of the last cases to be heard in this courtroom. Now it's the task of a trial to assess the evidence and to determine the truth. Sixteen years later, trial and error can reveal the true quality of much of that evidence. But even at the time, it was obvious that much of it was deeply flawed. 
take that damning statement from Uncle Abu, in which he says Kamara was with Gibbo, or Gilbert, the self-confessed killer, on the day of the murder. The evidence looks tidy enough. The last time I saw my nephew, John Kamara, was a week last Friday. That was in the morning when he made me a cup of tea. A friend of his, Gibbo, called. Each paragraph is actually countersigned by Kamara's brother, Philip. Everything then seems scrupulously above board. He spoke like broken English. When he spoke, the police could not understand the word he said. So then I had to like, be a translator to translate English back to English. But my uncle Abby was, was nearly seeing now. I mean, he wouldn't remember what happened the, the day before, what he had for his tea the day before. He wouldn't know that. So, I mean, if he said that Gibbo was, or Jibbo was at the house, he's most probably meaning like he seen him this morning, not like two weeks, there's no way he'd remember two weeks ago, there's no way, it's impossible. Yet yeah, you countersigned on the yes. statement that he'd said? I only signed what my uncle Abu said. So, with the police interviewing him, I just thought it was a joke anyway. Because, I mean, <laughs> it wouldn't even stand up with them. If you see an old man. In Uncle Abu's other two statements, Philip Kamara was not present. Perhaps there was no need. After all, he seems to have managed to come across clearly enough. Further to my statement, date the 26th of March 1981, statement and that I made to you on the 26th of March 1981, I wish to add that my nephew John Kamara has been living with me at 18 Gray Street since he came out of prison. But we've discovered evidence suggesting that the police knew from the very beginning that Uncle Abu was not to be relied upon. In one of the first police interviews with Kamara, the interviewing detective says, I understand your uncle's a bit senile and wouldn't be able to confirm the time you were at the house. So how, two weeks later, can they go round to Abu, expecting him to provide reliable and accurate recall of the day's events? The judge at trial said to the jury of Abu's evidence, Having seen and heard Abu Kamara, you may think really it is not safe to rely on anything he says one way or another. A fair warning. But by this time, it's too late. Abu Kamara's statements may be revealed as worthless in court, but it's those statements which have helped to put Kamara here in the dock. A young black with a record of offending, charged with a vicious murder, and tried in the edgy aftermath of the race riots of Toxteth. But what about the supposed innocent purpose of Kamara's visit to Uncle Abu in the first place, to collect his gyro? The police gave evidence that this just couldn't be true. Statements from DHSS officials showed that the day before Kamara was supposedly hunting for his gyro, he'd actually cashed one for £19.20. Unlikely then that he'd be expecting one on the Friday morning. But what we've discovered is that at exactly this period, Social Security was transferring from fortnightly to weekly payments. The £19.20 was exactly half of what Kamara was expecting. And at this very time, trial and error has discovered, the whole dole system in Liverpool had been thrown into chaos by a civil servant strike. So Kamara would have been expecting a second cheque, which would, in all likelihood, have been held up by the strike. We can also reveal, 16 years later, a crucial discrepancy in Kamara's police interrogation. Remember how suspicious it had seemed when Kamara started talking about things he'd done on the Thursday when asked to account for his movements on Friday the 13th, the day of the murder. But then we examined the statement of the policeman who was actually charged with writing everything down. And what's the first key question Kamara is asked? To account for his movements on Friday the 12th. But the 12th was a Thursday. Kamara may have been confused, but did the confusion start with his interrogators? There was, of course, this big issue at the trial. Was Kamara confused when he was answering the questions? And, you know, I often remember the old days of 
contemporaneous notes before tape recording when you would suggest to an officer that there was confusion or mistake. Oh, no, sir, that couldn't have happened. We couldn't have misunderstood one another. And now you hear the same kind of interview on tape, sometimes even see it on video, and you get precisely the kind of confusion and misunderstanding that the police always denied could happen, precisely the kind that Mr. Kamara alleged in this case. So, in other words, the jury today would have a blow-by-blow -blow account of the interview, and there would be no room for mistakes. But back to the day in question, the actual day of the murder, Friday the 13th. Finding nothing at Uncle Abu's, Kamara says he set off home. After a while, his sister Donna had turned up. She'd run away from school after the row. He says he took her straight back to sort things out with the teachers. When he was first questioned about the crime, Kamara believed this gave him an alibi. According to the timings, though, he could just have made it from the murder to the school in the time available. But did he look like a man with fresh blood on his hands? It's many years ago, but I, I distinctly remember speaking to Mr Gibbons the day the detectives left after I had made my statement. And we were both perplexed that someone could be as calm as that young man was if he'd been involved in such a horrendous crime. Mr Gibbons was the headmaster then? He's the headmaster, yes. Mm. I suppose really, I, I've, I've never never seen a murderer that, that, that I know of, so I'm not sure I would know exactly how to judge a, a murderer's mood or, or demeanour. But certainly Mr Kamara, an hour or so after the alleged murder, was a cool, calm, unruffled, supportive adult helping the school deal with a minor disciplinary problem and the thought of him being a murderer would never ever have crossed my mind in that situation. In fact at the time I remember thinking I'm the only one going to court on this. I was the only one that was asked for a, a statement and yet Mr Gibbons and Mr Jones were standing with me when this young man walked up the drive. What were you asked at trial? The Times. It was the Times I was asked at trial. I have no recollection of being asked about his... what he looked like. Just the Times, then? The Times. As we dug back into the case, we were puzzled that the evidence of a respected headmaster wasn't called, while instead the jury heard from prisoners who said Kamara had spoken to them about the crime while he was on remand. By definition, not the most honest of witnesses, prisoners are vulnerable to pressure from police and fellow convicts alike. Trial and Error's research team often find jailhouse confessions are used to shore up a shaky case. And the stuff from the remand prisoners is, is pretty thin stuff, isn't it? There's, there's the bloke who says, uh, I got the impression that he'd been there. And the man who subsequently became a, uh, went into a mental hospital. Um, what, did, what did the judge make of that? Well, the judge makes a lot of that, actually. But, I mean, basically, it was just one line. You know, he asked Kamara, were you there? And he said, yes. And that's the sum of his that's evidence. Of yeah. okay. As for McMahon, I mean, at committal, right at the beginning of the case, his evidence seems positively friendly towards Kamara. Mm, but, but, right. but by the trial itself, it, he seems to have changed completely. He seems to have remembered, as it were, an awful lot. Quite the most extraordinary evidence about the killing came from the prisoner, Paul McMahon. McMahon makes three statements, and his memory seems to get better as time goes on. But McMahon is not the most reliable of men. He has a history of criminal deception. We also know that his cooperation with the police in this case against Kamara was a key factor at his own subsequent trial. After 16 years there's no transcript of what McMahon actually said in the witness box but we have discovered this record of what he said when Kamara was committed for trial. He's telling the court how Johnny recounted the details of what had happened inside the betting office. And deep in the text, we find two key passages. John was telling me what Gilbert said to him. And John just told me about it. Not how he knew it. 
Yet by the time of the trial, according to the judges summing up, McMahon had shifted his position. A number of times Camaro was saying he wasn't involved, and a number of times he was. These days I think that there's much less reliance placed upon alleged conversations with villains in cells. It's not regarded as reliable, and even where it is used, you get much more disclosure to the defence of the circumstances in which the alleged conversation came to light. In other words, the defence have got much more opportunity to explore what has actually gone on because they are told more of the circumstances than would have been the case 15 years ago. So they might know if any inducements or threats had been made to those prisoners to come Or up. any inconsistencies in the story as it developed. Fluent police statements made by an uncle who turns out to be senile and incoherent. An innocent reason for going to look for the gyro. Schoolmasters who recall a calm and concerned brother rather than a fugitive fresh from a murder. And the suspect evidence of criminals. Would the full story have led the jury to a different verdict? Who knows? But one thing's for sure. If they'd been allowed to hear what trial and error can now reveal, Johnny Camara wouldn't have rotted in jail these last 16 years. At long last, trial and error can place before the public and the authorities evidence about the true identity of the second man in the betting shop. And it isn't Johnny Camara. Johnny Camara, prisoner H10109, is an embarrassment to Her Majesty's prison service. He's no trouble, but he's totally uncooperative. He refuses to do any work in the prison workshops and spends the days, 365 of them a year, an extra one every leap year, writing hundreds of letters to anyone who will listen to him. The replies are mostly polite and mostly useless. I am unable to become involved in For anyone who is not acquainted with your problems, there is nothing, nothing I can do to assist you. you. To me, as I, as I am not in a position to help you. problem with your own member of parliament. Parliamentary convention does not allow me to take up your case. The more time goes by, the harder it is to rescue Kamara from his fate and the system from the mistake it is perpetuating. What new could there possibly be to discover after so many years? The identification, the sighting of a struggle on the other side of the street, is the critical evidence against Kamara. But how could we discover, at a distance of 16 years, what exactly went on during Kamara's parade? After months spent talking to the black community of Liverpool 8, we struck lucky. We found a man who, all those years ago, had been asked by the police to be a volunteer. He was, we discovered, on Gilbert's ID parade and has good reason to remember the occasion. I got uh, identified. You were picked out? Yes. Who picked you out? The, the, um, the lady. You know, I don't know, I didn't know her name, so, you know, obviously. Obviously she um, looked up and down the line and um, tapped me on the, um, I think it was the right shoulder, I think it was the right shoulder. And then everybody turned turned around in the um, ID parade. Some was um, some was giggling because some knew me from the area, and they knew I was a working lad. So, so this lady picked you out, though you were a volunteer, and yet she failed to pick out Gilbert. Yes, which I found I found you know totally. Uh, she's a witness. You know she surely should get the right identity at the right man. Were you scared when, when you picked was, you up? I was terrified. I was thinking, well, you know, what, what's going to happen now? Now, the next identity parade is Kamara's identity parade, the one with Kamara on it. Are you saying you're on that as well? That's correct. Well, even though the lady who then comes back to try to pick out the second man, even though she's picked you out on the first parade, and presumably knows it isn't you, you're still on the second parade? Yes, I'm on, I'm on the Camaras. What, she's not allowed to pick you out, is she? No. The second no, time? No. Trial and error has discovered that Arthur Morrow was not the only person to appear on both Gilbert and Camaras parades. No fewer than seven out of twelve volunteers doubled up. 
Britain's leading authority on identity parades is Professor Graham Davis. He's advised the Home Office on best practice. The idea of the identification parade is that it should be a fair test of someone's ability to pick out a person from other like persons. Now clearly, if they've already seen and rejected uh, a, a large proportion of the people, as was in Kamara's case, then the number of alternatives, real alternatives for the witness, that is people that they've not seen before, is very, very much smaller. And so the risks of mistaken identity are subsequently increased because the parade, because the test is no longer fair. The 1979 regulations, which were then in place, state quite emphatically that where there are two suspects, there should be separate parades and that different people should appear on each parade. So the regulations were broken? The rules for the parades were broken on this point, yes. And the parade was defective in other ways. We know that Kamara at the time had a fairly short haircut. How did the others look? At the time I had a five to six inch afro. You had a large afro haircut at the time? Oh yes, about 60, uh, 65 inches high all the way around. That's top, sides, back. What sort of hair did Kamara have then? Oh, very short, about a one inch to one and a half inch afro. You know, if um, I have a picture, if you wish to um, to look at it, and up here, oh, what's this? this is the local football side, and this is in general how we appeared. So that's that just where and your there, finger is. There's me, yeah. where my finger is. Yes, as you can see, I have a large, large afro. Were there other people from that team who, who were on the parade? Oh yes, there's uh, one or two people, you know. Well, and the goalkeeper there, he's got a big haircut. The one in the green jersey. That's oh. Jimmy there. Was he on the parade? Yes. So at least two people with big afros, whereas Kamara just had a very short haircut. Very short. Were they all roughly the same age? Oh no, no, there was from, from 22 right down to 16. What about height? Were they... They all ought to have been roughly the same height, were they? Oh no, there was different, uh, difference in heights, good three, four inches. You know, as you say, you say to myself and a few others, the volunteers, some was five foot nine, you know, some were five ten, but Kamaris must be touching six foot. So there was a uh, quite significant in the height. He uh, stood out. Oh, stood out, okay. There have always been rules about how identification parades should be conducted. And those rules are not some sort of pettifogging bureaucracy. They've evolved as a result of miscarriages of justice in the past based on mistaken identification. And it's quite clear that in Kamara's case, those rules were unintentionally perhaps broken in a number of very significant instances. Nothing looked right is shirt was prison issue his trousers was five to six inches above the ankle and he had um, shoes we noticed with no um, no laces when you say the um, the trousers were five to six inches above his ankle that's because they weren't his trousers they weren't as far as we're concerned they must have been somebody a lot a lot, lot shorter and to cap it all there is a suggestion that in fact Kamara may well have been wearing prison gear on the parade, whereas all the other people were wearing their normal civilian clothing. Now, to have one member of the parade dressed as a prisoner is a highly suggestive process and quite likely in itself to produce the kind of bias that might lead to mistaken identification. Stevie Wonder could have picked them out. It was that obvious. And there's one other thing about Mrs. Edmund's evidence. Her identikit shows a man with a heavy moustache. Is that the face of the man the headmaster saw within an hour or so of the killing? You know, it is 15, 16 years ago, but that I would not recognise John Kamara from that at all. Why not? Well, certainly the moustache is, 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 is one of the most obvious features on that face, and my recollection of John Kamara was, I suppose, clean-shaven, or at, at worst, um, what do they call it? Designer stubble, that sort of thing. The, the moustache is very, very different on the identikit. 
But all this effort, all these 16 years, could have been avoided if it weren't for the rules under which the grand drama of justice is played out. You see, we haven't told you the whole story of what happened here when Raymond Gilbert and Johnny Kamara stood trial all those years ago. Because on the seventh morning of the trial, Raymond Gilbert suddenly stood up. All right, he said, I've had enough of this. I admit it. I did the murder. And he seemed about to say something else when the judge stopped him. All this took Kamara's defence completely by surprise. There was a hurried conference in the cells below the courtroom. The dilemma, should Kamara's side now call Gilbert as a witness to give evidence that Kamara wasn't with him? In the end, they decided not to take the risk. A tactical decision lawyers sometimes have to take, but we believe a wrong one because the jury reached their verdict without hearing from Gilbert, who knew the truth of who was there, and who, a few days after the trial, gave this statement to Kamara's lawyers. It is totally untrue to say that Kamara was in any way involved in the murder. He is a completely innocent man. But if Kamara wasn't Gilbert's accomplice, who was? For more than six years, this remained a mystery. And then, in February 1988, Merseyside Police received a strange telephone call. It's about Johnny. He wasn't there. Frank, you can't say that unless you were there. Look, there's no way I'm going to go to prison. You can't have it both ways. Either Johnny was there, or you must have been there to be able to say he wasn't there. I'm just saying Johnny wasn't there, believe me. Listen, me money's running. Frank, for God's sake, just answer me this one thing before you go. Were you at the scene of the murder? Yeah. Yet I was. On two occasions, a local villain, Frank Cade, rang the police and admitted to his part in the murder. That he, not Kamara, was Gilbert's accomplice. Some seven years after Kamara's conviction, Merseyside police saw Cade in prison where he was doing time for another crime. He admitted his part in the murder to a senior detective and in front of a prison officer. But when he was formally re-interviewed, Cade refused to say anything. Merseyside police reported to the Home Office that there was nothing in Cade's confession to worry about, and the Home Office regularly writes to Kamara's supporters to the same effect. There is no evidence, other than his telephone admissions and the aborted 1988 interview, which were contradicted in his earlier statements and undermined by his 1992 no-comment interview to link Mr. Cade with the murder. But that's not quite the case. Those who have asked the Home Office about Johnny Kamara haven't heard the full story. Because there is other evidence to link Frank Cade to this murder. It doesn't prove that he's the accomplice, but it's evidence that should be staring the authorities in the face. Remember the witness who spotted the scuffle going on? She helped to draw up a quite distinctive identikit. This is it. And this is Frank Cade. A photograph taken around the time of the murder of a man who phoned the police admitting his part in it. Excuse me, I'm a researcher working for a project for Channel 4 Television. I was wondering whether you could spare two to three minutes of your time to test your powers of observation. We went back to Leicester University and recruited Professor Davis's students to conduct an experiment. This is one such identikit. The student asked people to compare identikits of the suspects with photographs. Among those photographs were those of Gilbert, Kamara and Cade. What we did was to go out and ask a stratified sample of young people, middle-aged people, elderly people, whites and Caribbeans, males and females, who they thought the identikits were meant to be. When they were given the opportunity to look at Gilbert's identikit, or the identikit purporting to be Gilbert, they voted overwhelmingly for the fact that it was Gilbert. In other words, they agreed with the judge, the jury and everyone else that that was a, a passing resemblance to, to Gilbert, a good passing resemblance. When they were given the opportunity to decide who the identikit which purported to be Kamara was, then 
a very different pattern emerged. 72% of the people that we polled said they thought, in their opinion, that the man resembled Cade more than it did Kamara. How evidentially, academically compelling a result is, is that in your experience? Oh, statistically, it's, it's, it's an overwhelming effect. They don't get much stronger than that. Now, it's not for us to say who was with Raymond Gilbert on that wretched morning in the betting office, but we find it astonishing that in a case where virtually every element of the evidence against Johnny Kamara has collapsed, that the Home Office do not seem to have been made aware of this compelling piece of evidence. Bob Parry has long championed Johnny Kamara's innocence. He was Kamara's MP before stepping down at the election after a recent stroke. We showed him the evidence of which the Home Office had apparently been unaware. Having seen the identikit and the picture of Cade, do you think it is absolutely correct of the Home Office to say there is no other evidence to link Cade to the murder? No, absolutely no. I think that there is definitely, in my opinion, a very close resemblance. And take the glasses off, as you say, the moustache, and the, the Home Office should realise this, and the Medside Police should realise this. And they should have an investigation into the old case on this disinformation here. So at the moment when they say, as they say to all these MPs who write to them, so when the Home Office says there is no other information to link, are they wrong? They are wrong, yes. I believe so. But there's a final twist to this story. Suppose Johnny Kamara had been involved in the murder. Wouldn't he have made sure to get himself a proper alibi? Something better than what he came up with at the last moment that he half remembered seeing a man whose name he didn't know on the other side of town round the corner from his mother's. Shortly before the trial, private investigators for the defence tried to track down this vital witness but found nobody. Hardly surprising. Except that 16 years later, 16 years too late for Johnny Kamara, trial and error has found the missing man. The man stuck in Kamara's mind because he was out of place. A toxteth face seen the other side of town near his mother's house in Heighton. The face of this man. Well at that time, the time you're talking about, early 80s, I'd done a scheme, a youth opportunity scheme in Heighton. Uh, it was based in Heighton. And I was painting and decorating different houses in the area. Then when the scheme finished after 12 months, I started up on my own by advertising in a local paper. I'm not sure of the exact time when the scheme, whether it was the time John seen me during the scheme or it was later when I was working for myself, but I did work in that area and there's a great, I mean, a 100% possibility that it was me. How well did you know Johnny Kamara? Not very well. Um, where did you know him from? Uh, I had a flat in the South End, Liverpool 8, and there was a few people who used to come round the flat and John was one of them persons, or one of them people. Of course, he said that um, the reason why he was walking down here was he was going to get some ciggies, needed some ciggies. Is there a ciggy shop down here at the bottom? If you look straight down, there's some archways at the bottom. Uh -huh. That's Dovecot Parade. There's Dovecot shops, or known as Dovecot shops. And the cigarette shops to your left and your right of there. Uh, he would be surprised to see you in an unexpected place, not in Toxteth, but up by his mother's. Well, that's where he knew me from Toxteth, so as far as he would have known, the face or my name from Toxith, he wouldn't have put me to Dovecot or Heighton area. So for him to come along and say hello, or how are you doing, what are you doing here? He must have been in that area because that was the time I was working in that area, painting and decorating. After this long, Johnny Kamara could, if he wanted, be released on licence. But he won't be. This is the latest pronouncement from the parole board. He has made no attempt to confront his offending. He has no insight into his criminal behaviour. If, if he can't get out, he's going to die in prison because he's not going to admit to them that he's done it if he's never done it. Johnny Kamara's refusal to take part in a charade of pretended penitence is condemning him to stay in prison for the rest of his days. So now, after 16 years, it's time for the system itself to admit to the mistakes lies, bungles, that have left Johnny Kamara to rot. Since the making of that program, Deputy Head Teacher David Williams has sadly died. John Kamara's case and the evidence presented in the program 
is currently being considered by the Criminal Cases Review Commission. An announcement is expected shortly. There's an edit.